not under a compulsion. It's not mandatory. So when someone says, well, all parts of the Torah are mandatory, well, here's one that you get to do, but it's not mandatory. It is not required part of the Torah. Now look at, look, look at what it says in verse 20, in 22. If you, don't, if you abstain from a Nazarite vow, what did you sin? Huh? It's not a sin. If you abstain from a Nazarite vow, it's not a sin. Amen? Good. 24. I'm sorry, verse 23. That which has gone from your lips you shall guard and do. If you take a Nazarene vow and it's gone from your lips, you must guard and do it. For you voluntarily, circle that word, voluntarily vow to Yahweh what you have promised with your mouth. I promise. I promise to do this to my brothers and sisters. I promise to do this to my brothers and sisters. When you promise to do it unto one to the least of these my brethren, you promise to do it unto me. Don't tell your brother you'll go shopping for him or your sister you'll, you'll bake a cake, you'll clean the house, you'll do something for your brother. When you've, done, when you've not done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've not done it unto me, Mati Jaho 25, and you've done it to my brethren, you've done it to, to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. And so, so we are not to make a voluntary vow unless we are ready, willing, and able to perform that vow. I promise. Oh, I'm so tired of all the promises. Promises, yes, I'm through with promises, promises now. I am through with promises. Okay? Just do it. If you're going to make a vow, go perform the vow voluntarily, but you're not under compulsion to take a Nazarene vow. Do we have any Israelites here? Yes. Well, you, you can take a Nazarene vow, but once you do, you better guard it and you better not break it. And you better pay your vows to Yahweh. And if you're not sure, don't take it. If we don't vow, there's no sin. We're still Israelites. We should deliberate long and hard as led by the Ruach. Deliberate how long? Very long. As you know that Yahweh is empowering you and enabling you to do this Nazarene vow. Now what benefit is there in a Nazarene vow? Well, tons. Especially for you ladies. All right? Oh, messing with the hair. Messing with the hair on the legs. Come on now, getting quiet. Messing with the hair. Hey, uh, you're messing and fussing and fussing and mussing and messing and schmessing. All right? Now you take a Nazarene vow. Can't touch your nails. Can't touch your hair. Can't touch the hair on your legs. Can't touch the hair on your feet. Can't go to can't go can't go to a to get a pedicure. <laughs> All right, your history. You're gonna look. You're gonna look more like your ancestors did back when. Okay, or like they still do in Europe, where they don't bathe. They just they just put on cologne. So the point is, as a Nazarite, the, the hair has to be left alone. You can't shave your hair. Now, in modern society, a woman who doesn't shave is considered um, muchísimo loco. Okay? I mean, we, we tend to stay away from women who don't shave. Well, ladies, here's an opportunity to say, I am not concerned about how I look before men. I'm concerned about finding, doing, seeking, and performing Yahweh's will in my life. So... The Nazarite vow that is given to Yahweh voluntarily shows Yahweh, quote, I don't care what people think. I don't have to keep up with the Joneses. I don't have to look like Farrah Fawcett. I don't have to be one of Charlie's angels. I'm one of Yeshua's kids. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't have to be one of Charlie's angels. You're already one of Yeshua's kids. Be who you are. So, so in other words, if you're going to take that vow of the na Nazarene, the Notzre, the Nazarene vow, then make sure you pay it. Make sure you pay it. No shaving, no drinking wine, and no one, you can't be around dead things. You can't be around dead people. Well, wait a second. Before you take the Nazarene vow, you better think about something. You may work for someone who's dead in their trespasses and sins. Is Yahweh talking about physically dead or is he also talking about spiritually dead? Because if he's talking about spiritually dead, you're going to have to go to the wilderness. And you're going to have to buy a home in West Pensacola, like Yohanan Mascaro, where nobody lives except the crocodiles. 
All right? So now, you, but before you, you take your vow and you decide to pay your vow, you've got to say, now, wait a second. When Yahweh says, I can't have any contact with the dead, is he talking about the physically dead? Or is he talking about all kinds of dead folks, both physical and spiritual? Now, in the Pashat, he's talking about physically dead folks in the Pashat. However, in the Remez, Yahweh may be saying, no, 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 child, separate yourself. I mean, really separate yourself. Find a wilderness and start eating locusts and honey. So you may not be ready to give up your apartment. Uh-huh, you may be, then don't take the vow. You may not be ready to give up on your beautiful condo. That's right, so don't take the vow. So in other words, you've got to find out what this means in your life. That's what you've got to find out. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. But if you want to be really set apart for Yahweh, and you don't want to come into the spiritual or physical death, you're going to have to move out to the wilderness. And have people done that? Yes. And they're known as aesthetics at Oybe. Aesthetic sects. Did I get that right? They're known as aesthetic sects. Why are they known as aesthetic sects? Because they don't want to come into contact with either the physically or the spiritually defiled. Why did Yochanan Hamad Biel make his headquarters near the caves of Qumran? Because he, he didn't want to become physically or spiritually defiled. Is this making sense? Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Now go with me to Vayikra 27. I'm talking about Nazarene nuggets. Nazarene nuggets. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Vayikra Leviticus 27, 28. 27, 28. When a man lays under a ban for Yahweh, all he has, man or beast, that means dogs, cats, and whatever, whatever you need to leave to separate yourself from this world to perform your Nazarene vow, or the field of his possession, is neither sold or redeemed, whatever is laid under the ban is set apart to Yahweh. In other words, you live in Hialeah. You, 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 you have ocho gato and three cananinos. <laughs> and, you, and you have a condo. And you have a beautiful backyard with tomatoes and grapes and cucarachas <laughs> and plantos. <laughs> and that Spanish potato you guys keep cooking for me, I keep getting fat. What's that? Plantas? The Spanish potatoes? What's that? Huh? Plantas. Plantas. Uh, you can't sell it and go, uh, sorry, I'm moving, I'm taking a Nazarene vow, I'm moving into the wilderness, away from civilization, away from fax machines, away from email, away from all contact with civilization, and I'm going to seek, pray, meditate fast, seek after, with, like a deer panteth after water. I will seek Yahweh with all my heart. That's what I want to do. So I'm putting all my stuff up for sale, and I'm having a garage sale. Uh, gar gar what? It says, whatever you put under the ban in your life, you cannot sell or redeem. Meaning you've got to give it up because Yahweh is about to take it as a pledge, a down payment, a guarantee on the fact that you're going to perform the Nazarene vow. So your cat, your dog, your polo ponies, your swimming pool cannot be bought and sold through a real estate broker so you can take that money and give it to your children. When Yahweh says, no, no, whatever you put under the ban is mine. Because it's Kadosh Le Yahweh. Kadosh Le Yahweh. So whatever you give up and put under the ban, in other words, you put things, people, and places, property in your life under the ban because you're offering it as a offering, as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to Yahweh, it becomes kadosh because you have put it under the ban and you say, I don't need this television anymore. I am banning myself from television and I am giving this to Yahweh. So you have not paid a Nazarene vow. You've paid a different kind of vow. Whatever you put under the ban, here's the Torah principle. Whatever you put under the ban can never be returned, bought, or sold. Meaning... Uh, I'm going to give the TV to uh, my friend, and then I can always take it back when, I, you know, when my 
when I want to. No. No. You don't redeem it, trade it, or take it back. It is Kadosh le Yahweh. Turn to your neighbor and say Kadosh le Yahweh. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. What about if it's a beast? That's what it says. Whatever is put under the ban is Kadosh le Yahweh. It is Kadosh le Yahweh. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. So we're talking about the Torah of the Nazarite, the Nazarite, who vows to Yahweh to set apart and put under the ban whatever is in their hands. Okay, so you've got two principles working here. What's the first principle? Basics and advanced vows. Is anyone, is anyone with me? Yeah. I said, is anyone with me? Yeah. We've got the basic Nazaret vow, the Nazarite, the Torah of the Nazarite, and then we've got extra credit, curriculum, extra courses. So, you, in other words, you can be a Nazarite vow with three abstentions. Abstain from dead things, abstain from things made from the vine, and abstain from cutting any part of your bodily hair. That's e uh, that, that seems to be pretty easy. But then Yahweh says, now those of you who want extracurricular, extra rewards, or an extra head start to, to be unpolluted and untainted by the world, uh, um, you may want to put other things in your life under the ban. That might include some friends that need to be put under the ban. <laughs> That's a word for somebody. Put some friends under the ban and never take them back because they do you no good. All they do when they call is they want to party. Or they want to watch blockbuster videos. Let me tell you something. A friend who all they want to do is watch videos while in and of itself is not a wicked act. It doesn't do you any good because it doesn't build you up, edify you, and promote you in the things of the spirit. How many unsafe friends does Rabbi Moshe have? None. Zero. How many unsafe friends should you have? None. Zero. Get rid of them. Witness to them. Love them. Pray for them and get rid of them. Quick. Because all they're going to do is pull you into their cesspool. All they're going to do is pull you into their little club of, 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 and a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Don't tell me, well, I can resist doing what they're doing. I, can, I have the strength to resist. No, you don't. That's the height of deception that you have the strength to resist. It, I have found that it's easier for them to pull us down than for us to pull them up. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, therefore, steadfast in the faith. Well, if you don't fellowship and have chavurah with brothers and sisters in the faith, how are you going to resist the one who's walking around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? How's that going to happen? Amen. Oh, it's not going to happen. We need each other. We need each other. We are dependent upon each other. We are intertwined with each other. That's a word for somebody. Someone in this room needs to be putting some people, places, and things under the ban. Because you know what you do? You know what you do? You could take that thing that's causing you to stumble and offer it as a kadosh offering to Yahweh, and Yahweh takes it, and Yahweh says, it is mine, and it can never be sold, redeemed, or brought back to you. Are, are you with me? And let's be honest, maybe, maybe on animals, maybe with pets. Maybe you and I are too dependent on, on people, places, or things that, that, that choke our full reliance and our full dependence and our full leaning on the arms of Yahweh. So put them under the ban. Or, or if, you, if you feel you're ready to go for the whole, the, whole, the whole thing, go and take a Nazarene vow. And then don't fail to pay the Nazarene vow after you've taken it. Amen. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. No grapes or wine, no grape products, no cutting of the hair, no contact with the dead. One stipulation. It must be voluntary and it must be performed. Okay? Once you take that Nazarene vow, you must perform that Nazarene vow. You have no choice. No choice. Turn to your neighbor and say you have no choice. 
Once you take it, you have, I'll get there. Linda's whispering in my ear here, how long, okay? And if I answer that, I'm going to take the clothes away from my message. So rather than take the body and the clothes away, I'm just going to stick to my message. Okay, how long? And it's because people don't understand the concept of the Nazarene vow that they don't see Yeshua as ever having really been a literal Nazarite. Because that very question, how long, they see Yeshua coming into contact with what? Dead people, spiritually and dead people, physically. And so they think Yeshua could never have been a Nazarite. Well, we're about to find out a few different things. Go with me, please, to Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Go with me, please. Um, well, let's do Yochanan chapter 2. Yochanan, the Brit Hadashah. Yochanan chapter 2. Is anyone enjoying? Let's try that again. Is anyone enjoying? Yeah. Okay. Yochanan chapter 2, <laughs> verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana'a of Galil, and the mother, the mother of Yahshua was there. Both Yahshua and his taught ones were invited to the wedding. When they were short of wine, the mother of Yahshua said to him, have they no wine? Yeshua said to her woman, what is that to me and to you? My hour has not yet come. Now, we could read this a million years and not have a clue to what's really going on here. He did, he didn't, he shouldn't, but he could have, but he didn't, but he turned the water into wine. Why did he turn the water into wine? If he turned the water into wine, he wasn't a Nazarite. If he wasn't a Nazarite, then how can you teach he was a Nazarite? Who's on first? What's up? What's down? Right? And he says to his mother, he says, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. Now, according to religion, he should have been what? Worshiping his mother with the set-apart beads, right? And his mother said, and when his mother said to him, um, son, they don't have wine. Can you just snap your finger? Because I know you're the son of Yahweh. Can you just snap your finger and make some wine? Well, and then instead of Yeshua was saying, yes, Madre Maria, un momento. Madre, la Madonna, un momento, Madonna. No, he didn't say that, did he? He goes, woman, now just chill out. Relax. Relax. Or as Archie, Archie Bunker used to say, stifle yourself. Remember Archie, Baruch Hashem Yahweh. So Mary's complaining, like a nice Jewish mama, they don't get why. The wedding is over. It's finished. We're out of luck. We're out of business. We're out of business. No wine. And when the Jewish mother realizes there's no wine at the wedding, even if it's not her own daughter's wedding, she freaks out. <laughs> Miriam's freaking out. Not a very good co-savior and co-redemptist. She's freaking out that there's no wine at the wedding. Uh, so much for a perfect madre. Because in religion, they teach that she is co-redemptrix with Yeshua and that she, she was the, the, the birth of the Immaculate Conception. And most believers, if I ask you to raise your hand, well, you guys are different because you're part of the Miami Beach Israel revival. But most believers say, oh, yo creo en el concepto inmaculata. Si? No, I believe in the Immaculate Conception. You do, that means you're Catholic. I mean, Catholic. <laughs> because the, the, the Immaculate Conception has nothing to do with Yeshua's virgin birth, which is biblical. It has to do with Mary's alleged sinless birth and life to qualify her to be co-redemptress with Yeshua. So if you believe in the Immaculate Conception, you need deliverance. Right. Now, if you come to me and say, Rabbi, I believe in the virgin birth, and I will retort to you, I do too. We all believe in the virgin birth. But I don't believe in the Immaculate Conception. And if you ask most Protestants if they believe in the Immaculate Conception, they equate that with the Incarnation. And that is not the Incarnation. You can believe in the Incarnation and reject the Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Amen? So how many are willing to reject the Immaculate Conception? Absolutely. Because if you don't, Mary is, a co is your co-redemptress. 
Do I believe in Mary? Absolutely. I believe she was the mother of Yeshua, and I believe her womb was blessed, but I don't believe in her as some kind of divine co-redemptress. Okay, now, so if she was sinless, why do we have a, a portrayal of her in Scripture freaking out? She's, free, she's having an anxiety attack. Do you see this or do you see this? She's having an anxiety attack. How many know that anxiety attacks are worse than heart attacks? Heart attacks come once every 20 years or once in a lifetime. Anxiety attacks is when you think you're having one, but you're not having one, but you think you're having one, you're convinced you're having one, and now you want to convince everybody else you're having one, like Fred Sanford on Sanford and Son. He was having one every commercial break. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then they rolled in the sister Elizabeth, who was part of that Bible, that Sunday Bible study, to cast out demons of nicotine and, 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 and demons of whatever else, Ripple. So now, if Miriam had no sin, why should she have an anxiety attack? Because she's got a Hebrew wedding and they ran out of wine. If she was in the spirit, she'd be going, Oh, Yahweh, bring forth the new wine. She'd be doing something spiritual. <laughs> so she's freaking out. Now watch this. But here's what we miss, verse 4. Woman, I'm not making any wine right now. Sorry, my hour has not. Yet come. Now, what does that mean? Read that again. My hour. Have you ever wondered about that? Have you ever read that verse, Ted, and wondered about what that means? Woman, my hour has not yet come. What does that mean? It means I'm under a Nazarite vow and my hour of separation from my Nazarite vow has not come. In other words, I'm willing to help this couple in this wedding in Cana of Galilee, but not until I separate myself from the Nazarene vow that I have been under. What does scripture tell us about this miracle in Cana of Galilee? Does it not say it was the first of his many miracles? Does it not say it was the first time Yeshua began to manifest his miracles to his Tommy Dean? Do I need to read that, or can we all agree? That's what the scripture says. In Yochanan 2, it says this was the beginning of the times when his Talmudim would see Yeshua revealing himself as the Moshiach, and it was the beginning of his wonderful, miraculous, supernatural time on earth for 33 and a half years when he was the son of Yahweh who walked and lived and breathed among us. Can we all agree on that? He said, Miriam, look, I haven't separated myself. I haven't separated myself at this point. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Now, later on, later on in verse 7, he says, fill the water jugs, verse 8. Take it to the master, verse 9. We see the beginning, verse 11, the beginning of his signs. After this, he went to Kafar Nechum. Now, he said, not now, I'm not going to separate myself from my vow, but when did, he, when did he separate himself from the vow? Hello? When did he separate himself from the vow? Later in that event, when he turned the water into wine, he separated himself from the Nazarene vow on his father's table, timetable, not on his earthly mother's table timetable. Is any of this making sense? When he turned the water into wine, when, he f when they told the servants to fill the pots with water, he turned the water into wine, okay? Now, how do I know that's when he separated himself from the vow? How do I know? Well, I know. And in a minute, you're going to know if you don't fall asleep. Turn to your neighbor and say, in a minute, you're going to know. <laughs> so, so, in other words, what he's saying to, his, to Mary is, Mary, you may have a high position in man's esteem, but I respect you and honor you, but I'm sorry, I'm under an, a vow, and I'll separate myself from this vow when the Heavenly Father tells me to separate myself from this vow, and not when you command and demand through a Jewish mother's anxiety attack. Turn to your neighbor and say, Mary, Miriam had an anxiety attack. Wouldn't any Jewish mother that ran out of gefilte fish, matzo bowl soup, or wine? 
Yeah, you had you have you had a cor you you'd have a chorus of Ives in the house. I vain, I vine, I vine, I vine, I vine. Why you vine? Vine, I vine because I have no vine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, be quiet! I'm just having fun. I vine. The wife called. Why does the Jewish mother vine? She had a vine. So <laughs> now, Baruch Hashem Yahweh. So the idea is that Yeshua took a Nazarite vow from when he was young, listen, and he separated himself from this Nazarene vow to begin his ministry. You're not listening. He was under a Nazarene vow from the time he was born. For 30 years of his life, he was under a Nazarene vow. Matthew 2.23, he shall be called a Nazarene, a Nazarite. A Nutzrite from Nazareth. A Nutzrite from Nazareth. He was under a Nazarene vow from his mother's womb until this day in Cana when he began to show his contact with wine, his contact with the spiritually dead. This was the beginning of his ministry. After the Ruach HaKodesh had come upon him, he was still under his Nazarite vow in the Yardane River. He was still under the Nazarene vow, which he had from the his birth. When did he separate himself? When did he separate himself? Later at that wedding. On his father's schedule, not on his mother's schedule. Amen? Turn your neighbor and say on his father's schedule. Is anyone getting this? Is anyone getting this? Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Amen. How do I know that? Now, let's continue in verse number 12. Yochanan 2.12. After this, after what? After he turned the water into wine, after his hour had come. Hello? Have you ever read that scripture in, in verse 4 and saying, what on earth is Yeshua talking about? My hour has not come. What, what hour? What hour is he talking about? My hour from birth to separate myself to be a Nazarene. I'm still under that Nazarene vow, and my hour has, has not yet come to separate myself from that vow. Does that make sense? Oh, man. My hour has not yet come. It came later on his schedule, on his father's schedule, when he separated himself Onto Yahweh, and he says, I'm not under this Nazarene vow anymore. But wait a second. Didn't we just read in Bamidbar chapter 6? How does a Nazarene um, break and separate himself from his vow? How did we read that a Nazarene separates himself from his vow? Huh? Yes, and what else? He's got to go to the temple and pe perform the sacrifices. He's got to shave his head and perform the necessary sacrifices before the Kohen Hagadol, before the high priest. Can we see that? Yes, we can. Look at verse 12. Look at verse, I'm sorry, verse 12. After this, he went down to Kafar Nachum. In English, we say what? Capernaum. But in Hebrew, it's not Capernaum, it's the town.